Well, Scripture is pretty clear on this. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? I trust that you feel that way as well. Today we're going to be examining God's Word. No big surprise there. Uh, we'll be in God's uh, Word, in the epistle to the Ephesians, to the Christians who were at Ephesus. And we'll be in chapter 4, looking at verses 7 through 12. That'll be our focus this morning. In your sermon outline, you'll see that uh, I've listed out the last few months that we've spent in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 12. And in that interval, we uh, spoke about the worthy walk of the Christian. And then I elaborated on uh, five fundamentals of the worthy walk. And we then dug even further uh, to recognize the gift we receive from our great Lord. And we also saw what a great gift giver Christ is. If I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to stand then for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. And we begin at verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Let's remind ourselves of Isaiah the prophet's own words. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, that stands forever, that lasts forever. Allow me to lead us in prayer then. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth And the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight and yours alone, because you are our rock and our redeemer. So God, take this instruction that we've gleaned from your word and allow us to apply it into our lives so that we might be more mature as Christians, more dependent upon you even as we grow. So Father, take this time and and drive home these truths. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So if you would, allow me to go through that passage one more time for all of us. Let's look then at uh, verses 7 to 12 in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And some commentators believe that this is the time that Jesus was in the tomb and he went directly to hell as if to uh, really make it a bad day for the people in hell by showing his victory over sin, by showing his victory that he could transmit to those who would be his people. He who descended is himself also who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some as apostles. And remember I said apostles aren't around anymore. And prophets, same thing, aren't around anymore. They were there in that first century AD. And then some as evangelists, yes, still around. And some as pastor teachers. Remember I said that's the Granville Sharp rule in Greek, and when he has that definite article there, it counts for those two. And so the definite article came before the noun, which came before the conjunction, which came before the noun. So it's to be understood as pastor teachers. One, one job. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. And that last clause there is where we're going to camp this week. So let's recall that gospel means good news. 
that does not involve what men and women can do for God at all. That's not what the gospel is, but rather what God has already done for men and for women. Christianity is often mistaken as a group of uh, regulations that are to be obeyed rather than as a gift that is to be received. So what brings us to this point is, is chapters one to three, because they have told of all the riches that are ours in Christ Jesus. There's a huge inheritance for the believer. And chapters four, five, and six outline the actions that we are to take to please God in our lifetime here on earth. He has blessed us for a reason. And at this point, we need to ask ourselves some bigger questions. Questions like, why have leaders at all? Why can't we do like they did in the book of Judges, where each man just does what's right in his own mind? What, what are pastor, teachers, and evangelists really for? And, and here's what they're there for. For the equipping and the perfecting of the saints. Why have leaders in church at all? Because we need to equip and perfect the saints. And the saints, incidentally, is us. It's us. It's not a Catholic idea where you've got to have canonization. They've got to do some miracles. It's not that at all. Scripture says saints equals holy ones. Holy ones are the genuine saved people. Now, you, you've got some Greek phrase up there, don't we? I hope we do. Yes, we do. We have a Greek phrase up there. And that's the word uh, katartismon. Katartismon. And uh, this is the only time that it really appears in Scripture, although there are two cognates of it. There's katarsis. Katar, katartisis. Okay, what does that mean? For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray that you be made complete. Complete. Both those words are from this word katartidzo, which means this, to mend. To put it back together. To join it as it always should have been. Maybe in our thinking, to restore. To put it back together just as it should have been. Uh, let's uh, look further at Matthew chapter 4, verse 21. You should have it there in your sermon outlines. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father. What were they doing? Mending their nets. And he called them. In Galatians 6, 1, brothers, even if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each of you looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So the idea is one of restoration that is complete. So what are church leaders to be about? Not just equipping with information, but not just the teaching aspect of it, but also for the physical mending of the nets. Literally, for the mending, for the making complete of the saints, the holy ones, the set-apart ones, not tearing apart, but binding together. And as that is accomplished, the natural progression develops. Th think with me about, um, you remember Exodus chapter 18. Moses, and he's got this father-in-law. He's got this father-in-law named Jethro or Reuel. And uh, Moses had created a bottleneck. The Israelites were coming out. They were wandering through the desert. A couple of million people. And Moses had created this bottleneck. If anybody had a complaint, they were to come directly to Moses and he would hear their complaint and he would offer a solution. It's 
working for Moses. There's somebody there. Anytime he opens up the door, there's somebody there with a complaint that he can solve. It looks like it's working for him. The only problem with that structure was that he was solely to be addressing the complaints of several million people. How well do you think that worked? It didn't work at all. What could go wrong with that? Everything. As a matter of fact, Jethro got stuck with Moses' kids. And he brought Moses' kids back to Moses. And he says, Moses, what you're doing is not good at all. You're not only a, a good deli- you're not only a bad deliberator over here, you're a bad father over here too. The church is gifted people, not one bottleneck. So here's the progression you need to remember. Leaders are given to the church for a reason. What is it? To equip and to mend. But why equip? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Uh, Leaders are to equip for specific tasks. They are to equip the saints for the work of service. Now, that's an interesting word. Equip the saints, perfect the saints for the work of service. Uh, You're going to look at this Greek up here, and that's eis ergon. Ergon is work, and it always means work with sweat. Work that is really work. It's not easy work. It's tough work. And the last word there, eis ergon, diakonias. And and what do you hear in that? You hear deacon in there, don't you? Diakonias. Perhaps uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10 says it best. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. Now listen to this, because most people, they know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, but they don't know Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Why? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are to be involved in these works of service. And the leaders are supposed to assist us in doing that. A lot of churches today have a minister doing a lot and spectators in the seats. Well, this this smacks against that, doesn't it? It says that leaders, just like our despicable sinner right over here, (laughs) elder, he's an elder. He's to be training us. I am to be training you as well for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. This sounds a lot like diaconal work, doesn't it? It sounds like servant leadership. And who do we follow in servant leadership? Who's our example? In John chapter 13, do we remember that? Uh, who is it that washed the apostles' feet? Was it Mary Magdalene? No, it was Christ. It was Jesus the Messiah that washed the feet. And he said, I'm giving you a lesson here. Servant leadership means servants lead. So let's, let's listen to some pertinent wisdom about this topic of, of works of service. I'm, I'm going to read, I think I have, uh, well, there it is. I, I, I've pushed it beyond the limits there in Romans chapter 12. I wanted to start at verse 3 and read on from there. For through the grace given to me, I say to each one among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound thinking, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, 
So we who are, so we who are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, but having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy in agreement with the faith or service in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with generosity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy by abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in affliction, being devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, pursuing hospitality. And what do we, what do we learn from 1 Corinthians 4.1? This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He said this, let a man consider us in this manner. Consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. And in the next verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Well, you see the same idea here supported by slightly different words. In 2 Corinthians 3, 8, Paul contrasts the reflected glory in Moses' face with the work of the Holy Spirit when he wrote, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be even more in glory? Well, the next chapter, 2 Corinthians 4.1, strongly concludes, therefore, since we have this ministry, as we received mercy, we do not lose heart. Let's continue to 2 Corinthians 5.18, where we read, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And again in 2 Corinthians 6.3, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. So we've seen here kind of different words focusing on the same thing. Ministry, work of service, stewardship, servant. Is it getting a little clear here? Stewardship and servant. Is it, is it clear? God's progressive pattern is that he has leaders in his church that are to equip his people for works of service. In Colossians 4.17, Paul singles out this guy, Archippus. Archippus is there. And he singles him out and he says, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, Archippus, that you may fulfill it. That's like saying, Archippus, don't dare drop the baton. This is a relay race, don't drop the baton. And to Paul's closest disciple, Timothy, he wrote in 1 Timothy 1.12, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he regarded me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly, and this is Paul talking about himself, I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And in 2 Timothy 4, 5, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship, he's telling Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And six verses later, in 4, 11, Paul has these really sad words. This is the, the last epistle that he wrote, 2 Timothy. And he's, he's writing it. And, and he, he says, only Luke is with me. And then he says, well, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. This is the same John Mark that abandoned him on the first missionary journey. This is kind of Barnabas' cousin or Barnabas' nephew. 
And, and he left them. He was supposed to go for the whole trip. He left them there. And then Barnabas had the great idea to have a, another second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, hey, I got a great idea. Let's take John Mark with us. And Paul said, no way. He, he walked out on us before. You go ahead in your way. There's no way I'm taking John Mark. Well, here he is in 2 Timothy now. And he's forgiven him. He said, I've seen, seen what he's been doing in the interim. And, you know, that's, that's a guy that I'd like to have here. That's, that's, that's a good guy. Um, bring him with you for he's useful to me for service. You see God's pattern here, don't you? The leaders are to equip God's people for the work of service. And now, probably what you've been asking is, why? Why? You know what that's like saying? Can't Moses just do it all? <laughs> no. No, he can't. Why? Because we're trying to build up the body of Christ here. That's what we're trying to do. Well, what are the pastor teachers and evangelists really for? Why do we have leaders in the church at all? They're for the equipping and perfecting of the saints uh, toward works of service and finally to the building up of the body of Christ. Now here, the second Greek word up there it starts out oikos. It starts out O-I-K-O-S. That's the word for home. That's the word for home there. And this word is a little bit longer than that. And so it has home and then it has doma, which means to build. So this is the the Oikos part signifies home, yes, and the doma, build. And so this is the act of building or building up. If you, if you consider it metaphorically, uh, one writer says this is edifying or edification, the building up. And one lexicon defines it further as the act of one who promotes another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness. So let's look closely at Ephesians 2.21. And I'm going to back it up a bit to, to verse 19, actually. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being joined together is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And in Ephesians 4.16, Paul writes, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ, from whom the whole body being joined and held together by what every joint supplies according to the properly measured working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And 13 verses later in Ephesians 4.29, Paul says, Let no unwholesome, unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for building up what is needed so that it will give grace to those who hear. So now let's observe Romans 14, 19. I'm going to start at verse 18. For he who in this way serves Christ is pleasing to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. We build up externally by evangelism don't we? But here it's internally as believers are nurtured toward fruitful gift-based service in the body of Christ. Romans 15 2 continues the same thought. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his building up. We can move on to 1 Corinthians 14 12. So also you since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification 
of the church, for the building up of the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul writes about orderly worship, orderly worship services. He's talking about what's the outcome then, brothers? He says, when you assemble, each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has a translation. Let all things be done for edification, for the building up of all. 2 Corinthians 12, 19 reads, All this time you think we are defending ourselves to you. We speak in Christ, in the sight of God, and all these things, beloved, are for your building up. I would imagine if Paul was going to kind of name his ministry, he would say it's the building up. Finally, in 1 Thessalonians 5:11. Therefore, comfort one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Leaders were given to equip you and me. That's the reason for their existence. They are to equip you for the works of service and mercy. The church, which is its people, is to be different. These works of service ought to stand out. These works of service will build us up as individuals and as a church. In Acts 20, verse 32, Paul spoke to his brothers in ministry. That's what, those were the elders at Ephesus. He said, I commend you to God and to his word, which is able to build you up. Listen, folks, the maturing church is linked to learning and obeying God's word. Why do you think I'm always encouraging you to read your Bibles? And those of you that are so proud that you finally got through your Bible once, why don't I let up on you? Why do I keep saying, read it again? And again, and again, and again. Don't you dare get bored with it. Don't you dare get bored with it. That's God Almighty who wants to speak wisdom into your life. And you say, oh, it's tough. It's tough to understand sometimes. Get over it. This is the giant brain trying to get an idea into your puny heads. You're not supposed to get it the first time or the second time or the third. Maybe you'll get it the 50th time. Maybe. Maybe you'll get it the 75th time. Maybe. Speaking from experience, I can say you won't. <laughs> it's the best thing ever written. It's the best thing ever written and it's for your good. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter wrote this. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word. Why? So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So you would think, oh, I'm only supposed to do this if I've tasted the kindness of the Lord. No, that's a first class condition in Greek. You may not know what that means now, but in a second you'll know. A first class condition in Greek means it's not iffy at all. It's better to translate since. Since. It's a statement of reality. So let me go through that again, and I'll read it in there. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the world, word, so that you may grow in respect to salvation, since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. This is the way Christians act. This is what Christians do. 
If you've gone through the word of God now and you've thrown it out, ooh, I shudder to think where you'll end up. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word. That if is not in doubt. It's a statement of reality. So what now? How might I apply this message in my own life or in your own life? First, let me just ask, ask yourself, are you a respecter of church leadership? Or are you a critic? And then, I, something else up there, it says, who elected you? And I kind of mean that two different ways. If God elected you, then you should not be a critic of church leadership. If the congregation elected you, yeah, you shouldn't be a critic either. And then ask yourself this, do you understand that those leaders are to mend the nets in the church by urging you to become equipped, by inviting you to learn and attend, and by sharing your faith? Also by pointing you toward works of service here even in the church. And there's a, there's a list of them there. You can help out in the nursery. You could teach in Sunday school. You can assist at the church. You can bring meals. You can, you can bring donations to the less fortunate. You can, you can help anywhere and everywhere. But I can tell you one thing. You're not supposed to be spectators. I got that down pretty clear. Well, let's go ahead and pray. I thought maybe I would uh, continue to preach until it stopped raining, but <laughs> let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you. And we are just a, a cluster of sinners, Lord, always seemingly finding difficulties following you. Help us, Lord, to overcome those temptations. And certainly, Lord, in a, in a culture like ours, that's driven so much to leisure time. Help us to see that as relatively bad, that uh, when we're not doing your work, it's not that good. So, so God, uh, jog our memories. Show us, Lord, how we can come in greater conformity to your word. Uh, allow your Holy Spirit, Lord, to annoy us into doing the right thing. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.